My name is Warren Spector, and I'm the uh, general manager and uh, creative director at Junction Point Studios. I believe with every fiber of my being that games can tell stories as deep and as sophisticated as movies, books, or any other medium. This game is no exception. The power of Walt Disney's imagination brought into being this alternate world called the Wasteland, where all of Disney's forgotten and rejected characters, they all end up in the cartoon Wasteland. Mickey Mouse inadvertently discovers this place. Mischievously, he plays with the magics and creates a monster. And Mickey flees, not even knowing that anything bad has happened. But the blot is furious, so he just devastates the world. But this world has a hero of its own. It's got Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, the first forgotten, rejected character that, that Disney created. And so Oswald and the blot engage in the blot wars, which rage for years. One of the most important things in the game is the idea of a heart. No character in the Wasteland has a heart. Mickey has the most powerful heart of all. The villains of the piece are gonna steal his heart and use it so they can get out and trap Mickey in the Wasteland. But Mickey escapes. But as he explores the Wasteland, what he discovers is that he's responsible for the devastation of this world. And if he just leaves without righting that wrong, his old friends are gonna be living in a not very pleasant life. Mickey's core abilities in the game involve the manipulation of paint. He can actually control the power of paint and the power of thinner. Now with thinner, anything that's painted in the world, he can just erase it. He can erase a wall, he can erase the ceiling, jump up through it. One of my goals for the game is to, uh, is to put Mickey in a, a story that, that really confronts him with the kinds of challenges worthy of a hero. And uh, that's kind of the heart of the story. It's about redeeming yourself, redeeming others, and healing the land. And at the end of the day, I, I think mostly it'll be about being a hero, uh, having fun, and engaging in an epic story. In Disney Epic Mickey, story is critical because it, it's the thing that gives importance to all the player choices and player actions. You're actually being taken through a story but it's a story of your own telling. Disney's always been about telling a story, getting people interested, getting an emotion going, getting a laugh going, and the game pulls that off. It's not just you interacting with a bunch of pixels, it's you interacting with characters that even you've forgotten about as Mickey Mouse. So story is what provides that kind of context. It makes what the player does uh, important. The birth of the idea actually uh, came from Disney itself. A lot of people think that I went to Disney and said, give me Mickey Mouse, and that's not the way it happened at all. I sat down with Disney talking about a fantasy game and a science fiction game I wanted to do, uh, and they were you know, not particularly interested in it, frankly. Instead, they asked me if, if I was interested in doing a Mickey Mouse game, and my eyes opened up and my jaw hit the ground, and, and uh, I said, well, yeah. And then all these Disney executives, it was so cute, they. Uh, they just, they said, well, well, we have a concept. Can, is it okay if we pitch it to you? And I'm sitting there going, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> and, and they did, uh, and it was, it was genius. It, it included some of the foundational elements that are still part of the game today. The idea of a world for forgotten and rejected characters, bringing Oswald back. All that came from within Disney. The key to game stories is to, to recognize the place of story in games. It's not about an author telling a story to a reader. It's not about a director conveying information to a passive audience that just interprets what, what they're seeing on the screen. It's about providing situations, problems, that are personally significant to players that they then get to decide how to interact with. With Disney Animation, that was one of the things that was extremely important to Walt Disney was that it's the story that ties everything together. That's the, the journey that the, the audience, the player, goes on, and that's what we tried to tie into. It really runs core and parallel with uh, Warren's philosophy of playstyle matters because you're playing as Mickey Mouse. Making sure that we had a believable and impactful story throughout the game made so much of this game happen. If story is about uh, significance, about making player choices significant and interesting, uh, you have to have something more going on than just beat the bad guy. In this case, I, I knew I wanted to tell a story about family. When you have Mickey and his older brother Oswald the Lucky Rabbit as your central characters, 
That's a brother story, and so I knew I wanted to play with that. Even though what you're doing is, you know, you're deciding whether, whether to erase your enemies or befriend your enemies by using paint, uh, the real story is about you reconnecting with your brother. It's about how important are family and friends to you. But that's the key. It's how important is it to you? It's about, hey, how do you feel about this? You tell me through the play choices that you make. That's what makes a great game story. It's about this, this dialogue between, well, you know, me in this case and the team and every person who plays. I was in when they said, you want to make a Mickey Mouse game. But when they told me they'd gotten Oswald back, I, I, I lost it. I mean, I was done. I'm an old animation buff. I mean, I knew about Oswald before they mentioned him to me, which is kind of rare. And when they said, you're going to have the opportunity to present Oswald on screen in a new Disney story for the first time since 1928, I mean, what an honor. Well, Oswald the, the Lucky Rabbit was Walt Disney's first cartoon star, and he, he predates Mickey, of course. He's such a rich character, and if you look back at the old animation, it was so fun and so exciting. Oswald was different from other animated film stars of that time. Those cartoons that Walt Nub made were, they were little gems of storytelling. They weren't just a string of gags. Oswald would fall in love, have to deal with a rival, he would go to war, he would, uh, he would do all sorts of things. He was way ahead of his time. You know, very quickly, the Oswald cartoons became among the most popular silent cartoons of the late 20s. Oswald was a big star. In the late 20s, after just about 18 months of prominence, Walt went to his distributor uh, to renew his contract and wanted more money to make better cartoons. I mean, even then, Walt was all about quality. And the distributor said, no, not only are we not going to give you more, we're going to take your staff, we own the rights to the character, check your contract, uh, and you're out of work. After losing that character, Walt went back to the drawing board, literally, and Mickey Mouse comes into being. And so Mickey Mouse goes down a path of success no one saw it coming. Maybe Walt did, but you know, he is what he is. Everyone on Earth knows who Mickey Mouse is. And Oswald just kind of disappeared. There are all sorts of stories about how Mickey was created, but he was created only because the rights to Oswald had been lost. That's the tragedy of Oswald. Uh, he, he really was poised to be the most successful and popular cartoon star in the world. Uh, but uh, Mickey came along, and uh, the rest is history. Huh? <laughs> Shh. Oswald came back into the Disney fold in 2006, not to star in Disney Epic Mickey, but rather to serve as a catalyst for the game, because really he was the first forgotten character in Disney history. That's kind of the factual story. The sort of, the heart of that story, though, is Oswald is Mickey Mouse's older brother. Uh, and Oswald looks at Mickey's success and just says, I was famous. You stole the life that should have been mine. We ran with that idea, not only playing with uh, his kind of sibling rivalry, the forgotten brother, but we also used him as a path for redemption for Mickey. In his own arc, finding out that he had family that he had forgotten or didn't even know about, but then also trying to find his way through crafting this relationship once again with this person that he didn't even know was family. He's an emotional touchstone for Mickey, for players. Uh, as you see Oswald change in the way he's responding to Mickey because of what the player is doing as Mickey, you can sort of gauge your progress. Oswald ultimately does re-engage with Mickey. Mickey does redeem Oswald. And that growing relationship is a measure of the player's progress. I love Oswald, and I want to make him a hero too. That's, you know, kind of goal 1.5 for this project. I remind people how incredible a character Oswald is and set him up for, for success as a cartoon star, as a plush toy, you know, you name it. I want Oswald everywhere because he deserves it. Disneyland is kind of the foundation for everything in the game. 
finding a place that everyone knows, everyone understands, everyone has been to and has feelings about, that was really important to me, that we sort of suck people in with the familiar and then sort of turn everything upside down. If Walt Disney was going to bring into existence a world for forgotten and rejected characters, what form would it take? It's going to be his fondest dream, which is to build this park where adults and kids can experience joy together and where his characters, his creations, can live forever. In that sort of imaginary creation, it wasn't born fully formed. It wasn't perfect. It was incomplete. And so Oswald, its first inhabitant, had to finish it. He sort of has a sense that there's this thing out there, this park, this beautiful place, you know, a place of magic. And so he's trying to recreate it as best he can, but he's never seen it. He's got old photographs and blueprints and stuff to work from. So this was essentially taking that same aspect of the cartoon characters who are forgotten or rejected and applying it to Disneyland. So rides that are rejected, animatronics that are rejected, shops that are rejected, pr pretty much anything that was in Disneyland or was even considered for Disneyland ended up becoming part of Wasteland. Disneyland has a lot to teach game designers. It, it's pretty incredible. The way the place is structured with a hub and spokes and transition areas that take you out of one place and, and sort of ease you into another one. We kept looking at all of the little details in the park that had come up throughout history and, and what we could do to pull from each one of those. Tomorrowland itself provided us a, a lot of inspiration for things that had been taken out and replaced. For a majority of the Tomorrowland Beetleworks characters, they've got elements of Tomorrowland from the theme parks in there. So you'll see little bits and pieces and a lot of diehard Disney fans will be able to pick out certain characters or different rides. We tell stories through space and there is no one better than an Imagineer at doing that. What the Imagineers do has infinite lessons to teach us. There were a variety of things that we drew direct inspiration from. The first one actually was uh, a location called Mean Street. I knew that I needed an instantly recognizable place. And so Main Street USA, that iconic image that we all have burned in our brains from early childhood, that image had to be in the game and it had to be slightly warped. Gremlin Village is sort of small world, sort of utilitunnels underneath Disneyland, you know, mixed together. It maintains the same Mary Blair feel of texture and color and, you know, just crazy uh, circus kind of palette. Yet yeah, we, we come back and, and totally uh, weather it and wear it and, and, and dilapidate it. The iconic clock tower. Uh, I looked at that thing at Disneyland and I just said, that's got to be my first boss monster. That, that thing has to come to life. For Lonesome Manor, we start out in the graveyard. In the park, there's actually a line that kind of meanders through the graveyard. We kept the same sort of theme, but kind of turned it into more of a platforming experience. We kept a certain rooms and themes, the ballroom, the library, the stretching room. Everyone who goes to Disney World stands there and they watch those paintings stretch and they see the flashes at the top. Well, here, you're gonna interact with that stuff. We wanted to hint, you know, at the real place, at the real Disney, but from there we we could veer off and, and make it as dark or crazy as we wanted it to be, which was really fun. It really kind of falls into this world of wasteland being something that people can identify with and feel very familiar and comfortable, but at the same time, it doesn't quite match up to uh, reality, and of course that's as intended. I hope it's kind of you know, recognizable but different, familiar yet strange, and funny but kind of sad in its own way. I want players to feel that whole range of emotions, but always recognizing that this is based on Disneyland. And, and frankly, you know, if you know things about Disneyland, if you know things about Disney's, Disney's history, things will, will be more significant than if you don't have that background. So Disney fans, I think, are gonna have a blast. Animation is one of the most important things I think we have to capture as a Disney studio and as a Disney game. Mickey in stillness is obviously Mickey. I mean, any combination of three circles is identified as Mickey by almost everyone on the planet. But Mickey in motion is what makes Mickey. 
the way Mickey moves is critical. Boy, did everybody here watch a lot of cartoons. We have all of the Mickey cartoons, all the Oswald cartoons, and all the features. And we would sit here and watch them over lunch and talk about what made them special and what made them great and what elements we wanted to incorporate into the game. Looking back through the archives, seeing how those characters were animated in their original roles, and bringing that to Disney Epic Mickey. We consulted with feature animation, we consulted with Pixar. In making a game about Mickey Mouse, of course, the animation quality in our title had to match feature movies. That was the kind of fidelity we were trying to achieve. I wanted uh, Smee moving the way Smee moves. I wanted Horace Horse Collar moving the way Horace moves and Clarabelle moving the way she moves. I'm telling you, the animators nailed it. Disney has a series of lectures all the way from, you know, some of the nine old men up to the present. We have access to all of those so we could learn from the masters. We had uh, access to some of the most senior animators at Disney Feature Animation and Trust me, they critiqued our animations. There was a level of detail that those guys can get to about specific animations that I had never seen in my life. And I've been working with animators, you know, for, for 30 plus years. The animators, early in the project, recreated moments from real Mickey cartoons. Each one of us took a scene and reproduced it in 3D from what we saw in 2D, trying to figure out what was the appeal that drew us to Mickey in the first place. We did extensive research just to make sure that the animators had the spot-on feel of not only the personality of those characters, but also what the Disney animators had brought to those characters to begin with. Why did they rotate his ears this way? Why did they turn his head and cock his head this way? How do we take that and then find a balance that would work well in 3D? We actually composited uh, our Mickey into real Mickey cartoons, and people couldn't tell. That's when I knew we had nailed it. And it wasn't that we were literally going to imitate specific animations, but once the animators could imitate them, I knew they'd embodied the character. And for an animator, that's critical. There are clearly differences in a medium where you have 24 frames a second, you know, and you can spend 24 hours rendering one second of screen time, and a medium where you're, you're trying to do 30 frames a second and render them in real time. In a game, we have completely different constraints. We're about repeated actions. We are all about magic moments, but they're magic moments that players create by combining those repeated actions in different ways, in different contexts. I have a designer I work with closely who keeps me on my toes and makes sure that I'm not putting too much into my animation that would take away from the player's experience. It's this exquisite balancing act between beautiful animation, expressive, emotion-filled, communicative animation, and player control. So that way, when they want to turn right, it's responsive. So it's a give and take back and forth. The animators here are expert, and the gameplay programmers are expert at balancing the need for players to be in split-second control, I mean, down to milliseconds of control, and beautifully expressive animation. When we go back and we talk about remembering these characters, we wanted them to be remembered in the light that they were originally introduced. The animators on this team did a great job in bringing that to the game and to the player. I look at the game and I just think we've captured the essence of Disney animation in a game. Disney, in an 80 plus year history, he created stories and characters that touched all of us. And when you create that much, some of it isn't quite gonna work out. This is 80 years of history sort of together in one piece for the first time that players can interact with. There's a lot of stuff there. There's enough there for a hundred games. I wanted to just honor that rich creative history and remind people not just about the things that they remember, but all that stuff that they've forgotten. Getting the opportunity to, to visit, you know, the Disney archives and just look at how much information has been stored over these past 80 years is mind-blowing. You know, you get to see these old pre-production drawings from Fantasia, or what Pinocchio was gonna look like, or Captain Hook in blue, really? Tons of cool stuff to see. Now, as a fan of Disney animations, it was a great opportunity for us to go back, relive a lot of the, the characters I loved as a child, and then 
reintroduce them for today's market. And some of the stuff is so cool, we don't know why it ended up in an archive and didn't make it to screen or to print. So we were really excited to be able to grab some of those things, pull them out, and give them new life. The problem wasn't what to put in, the problem was what to put out, because Disney's history is so rich and there are so many characters and places to, to choose from. Uh, the weeding out process was a nightmare. The whole story around Disney Epic Mickey is about remembering these forgotten characters. And not only is Mickey doing that, but the player is doing that as well. And so their role kind of became this unique and interesting part of the story in the game, because as you, the player, go through, you're learning about characters that you may have never seen before in the Disney archives. And now you're remembering them as well as allowing Mickey to remember them. In Oswald's case, we had to remind people what his personality was like, what his abilities were, uh, what made him one of the most popular stars in, in the late 20s. For some of the other guys, you know, it was really, they're kind of foils for Mickey. They're ways to remind Mickey that even he's forgotten his old friends. We've got a character who himself has forgotten characters like Clarabelle Cow and Horace Horse Collar and the Mad Doctor and uh, Gus the Gremlin. Those are characters that, that, in some cases, he interacted with a bunch in his early cartoons, and so we get to have him play the role of the, the player so we can show kind of the sadness of the, the characters who have been forgotten by Mickey and, and by the player and use them to evoke some emotions in the, the player that uh, I think will enrich the experience. We really tried to be as true as we could to the reality of these characters as the Disney animators and as Disney himself created them. One of the first rules I set up for the team was if something from the Disney universe, that, that creative history, works for us, then we're going to use it. We're not going to create or change it. As we went through the archives and looked at the different characters, we saw all that charm, uh, all of that character, all of that personality that really has been forgotten. And that, that was a kind of big decision point in pulling those characters back into the game so people can remember them and enjoy them again. This team really embraced the challenge of immersing themselves in Disney's history. Disney Epic Mickey is, in a really strange sense, a history lesson. I hope nobody perceives it that way. I don't want people put off by that. But at the end of the day, players are going to learn something about Disney's creative past. Disney fans in particular, I think, are going to have a great time playing the, the where did that come from game. Because almost everything in the game is inspired by something real. 